Okay. Let's get started. We're in the home stretch now on day two. Um, and I anticipate this to be a really, really great session. I'm very interested to, uh, to hear what our presenters are going to uh, speak about. So uh, I'm Gretchen Navidi with NIMH, and this is the technology panel. And we will start off with uh, Dr. Bradley Stein, who is a senior physician policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Gretchen, thank you. So we're both in the end, and I've been told that if I talk quickly enough, I may have a couple minutes for questions, so I'm going to be moving mm -hmm. fairly quickly. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is child psychiatric telephone consultation programs. Let me start off by acknowledging my co-authors on this work and also the funding we've received from this work for the NIMH. I also want to acknowledge the National Network of Child Psychiatry Access Programs who gave us data that you will see is critical for the work we did here. Um, I don't have any financial conflicts, but I do want to share that I've served, having done research in this area, I've served on their advisory board for the last five or ten years. It's a volunteer position, but it is a potential perceived conflict, so I want people to be aware of it. Um, so what am I going to talk about today? It's probably not a surprise to men in this audience um, that many mental health problems have their onset in childhood, and data suggests that approximately a quarter of children experience some type of mental health disorder annually, um, with somewhat less than half having, by their teenage years, met lifetime criteria for multiple disorders. Um, Sadly, data suggests in this country that there's over a decade between the onset of mental health symptoms and first treatment, um, and much of this affects kids given the nature of the onset of the disorders. And so studies suggest, and it depends on methods, that somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of children with mental health problems have an unmet need for mental health care. Um, and data, more recent data suggests that it's improved slightly, so two to three percent improvement over about a decade. Um, but clearly, if you're thinking about the magnitude of these numbers, there's still quite a ways we need to go. Um, it, this has an impact in so many ways. It affects kids functionally at home, in school, with friends, in their community. And I think it's particularly important to realize that mental health disorders, particularly untreated disorders, during childhood and adolescence can affect developmental trajectories and really have lifelong impacts in any number of ways, um, income, education, employment, um, not to mention early morbidity and mortality. Um, sadly, the system we have is inadequate to meeting children's mental health needs. So I don't know how many of you were at Jurgen's talk this morning where he talked about the specialty adult system and how it's inadequate. Take that and sort of multiply the problems by two or three and you've got the child mental health system, all right? There's far fewer child psychiatrists, um, but it's not just child psychiatrists. All those other types of mental health professionals, um, in many locations there are very long waiting lists. Um, if there are any at all, many people aren't taking new patients. Um, it's not just psychiatrists that don't necessarily accept insurance. Many of the other mental health professionals who specialize in kids don't either because there is so much more demand than there is supply, so they can sort of pick and choose. Um, so one of the areas, and again, this is kind of channeling Jurgen, that you do see people looking for increased treatment is by pediatricians. And it's pretty clear that pediatricians are playing an increasingly important role in addressing children's mental health care. Um, however, you know, one approach that has been taken is sort of co-locating or putting mental health professionals in pediatric practices. I think in, this is certainly promising, but for all kinds of reasons, there are many practices for which this does not work. Um, and if you talk to the pediatricians, many of them say, okay, you know, I can do this, like as long as it's ADHD and uncomplicated ADHD, but if it goes beyond that, um, where's that psychiatry button that Jurgen was talking about? Because I really need one of those. Um, so, you know, one of the themes that you've heard about during the session is the potential role of technology. And I, I'm, I'm sort of intimidated to be up here with people who are going to be talking about so many really innovative technologies that we can use. The internet, electronic health records, digital psychotherapy, tremendous types of approaches that we can use technology to potentially address this gap. I'm also going to be talking about a different new technology. However, the different new technology I'm going to be talking about was, was new about 100 years ago. 
Um, so we're going to go to something very complicated, such as the telephone. And what I'm going to talk about, I think the formal name is Child Behavioral Health Telehealth Access Programs. Um, but they're more commonly known as Child Psychiatry Access Programs. And this grew out, many of you may be familiar with MCPAP, which was the first program started in Massachusetts in 2004. Um, and there are now variations of this that you see in over 30 states. And they, they all differ a little bit, but I think if the key components of these types of programs is that they have a clinician, most commonly a child psychiatrist, who's available for consultation immediately via telephone hotline. So if you have a pediatrician who has a kid in the office with a behavioral health problem and they're not sure what to do, they can pick up the phone and hopefully talk to or get a call back from a child psychiatrist while that kid and family is still in the office. The majority of cases, when you look at the data from these programs, it really involves that telephone consultation, but many programs also offer, in some cases, a single face-to-face -face consultation for the family if the child psychiatrist really isn't sure what's going on, and also offers sort of care coordination with assistance for referrals. So again, this is, it, it's certainly not the collaborative care that you heard Jurgen talk about. It's not nearly as organized, but you will see hear elements of that existing here. Um, they've studied these programs, pediatricians like them, they expand, pediatricians feel that it helps them treat more kids. Um, we actually don't know much more than that, but because of the desperate need here in the last federal budget, there was specifically a line item of $10 million to expand such programs with the HRSA announcement, for those of you who are interested after this talk, um, it actually, I think, hit the street last week. Um, for states or other organizations to apply to expand these programs. So as I said, lots of uptake in states where they have them, although sometimes it takes a little bit. Um, pediatricians, they're better able to meet their patients' needs, and they're better able to meet their patients' preferences, but we really haven't looked at their impact on what they're doing about kids' ability to get mental health services. So this is a question we were interested in. So what did we do? We used multiple years, waves of surveys from the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, and across those four sort of waves, we had almost 250,000 children, um, aged five to 17, that the parent or other sort of adult guardian was asked the question, during the past 12 months, has your child received any treatment or counseling from a mental health professional? And so what we did then is we looked at state rollouts of these programs and used the opportunity of variation across states and within states over time to create sort of a natural experiment to examine whether these programs seem to increase children's access to mental health services. Our analysis was a multivariate logistic regression and without going into details because of sampling weights we did all of those fancy things, and I can get my uh, more sophisticated colleagues to talk to you about it. And as I said, we used the variation in programs to essentially do a difference in difference analysis. Um, in our multivariate aggression, we controlled for the child's gender, age, race, ethnicity, insurance status, the highest educational level for the parent in the household, and also the year of the survey. So what did we learn? Well, one, over time, there does seem to be sort of a secular trend towards kids getting more mental health services. In terms of variation in state, the first wave of the survey was before 2004, so at that point, there were no such programs. And when we categorized the MCPAP-type programs, we either said a state had, in a given year, did not have a program, had a program which theoretically was covering the entire state, or sometimes states will use sort of pilot programs and say it's only in a county or two. And there are enough of those that we called the state with a partial program. And you can see the variation in 2016 of kind of the distribution of kids living in states with the various types of programs. Bottom line, what did we learn? that the percentage of children rece reporting receiving mental health care among residents of states with the statewide programs was significantly higher 
than the percentage in states without such programs. Um, we did not see that type of effect in the states with the partial programs. It really looked like you needed the full kind of geographic coverage. Um, and not surprisingly, many of our other findings are things that you consistently see in the literature. Um, many of the populations that we know are much, more, much less likely to get services in our, survey, in our analysis also were less likely to get services. So, briefly, what did we learn? Well, the statewide child psychiatry programs do appear to increase the likelihood of children receiving mental health services. Um, but I think the two other points that sort of go along with this is at the population level, it matters, but the, it, it's not a silver bullet. It's moving the needle a little bit. Um, and that the effect is modest, and that the rates remain concerningly low. Remember, we have 50 to 80% of kids not receiving treatment. So while for the one or 2% who these types of programs are able to get into services, that probably means a lot, there's still far more that needs to be done. Um, particularly in the light of the fact that we saw that it really took statewide programs but that so many states, at least to date, only had these partial programs. Um, I think the secular trend for children to get more mental health care was also certainly encouraging. Um, we're not sure why, we can certainly speculate. Um, some would say that there's less stigma about children's mental health services and more awareness of the needs for services. There also have been policy changes in the time frame we've looked at, such as mental health parity and the Affordable Care Act, which in the adult literature have been shown to also, you see the secular trend of individuals receiving more mental health services over time. So that finding is consistent, we're not sure why. Um, the, we continue to see the disparities that we've seen in all kinds of other analyses, right? These, these large kind of groups who are at risk of not getting services, this does not seem to close the gap. It continues to be there. And I think as we're thinking about how do we address these problems, that this type of intervention is something that sort of modifies our clinical system. But as you heard others sort of allude to this morning, that many of addressing these more fundamental problems and access and utilization may require much more fundamental societal level interventions that go beyond what can we do in terms of a healthcare system and access. Limitations, I think, are important to note. We had very gross measures of the Child Psychiatry Access Program. It's, is it there or not? Um, and so we didn't have information about the different components of the program that probably matter or how it was implemented, how it was rolled out over time. The survey data is an annual, so we weren't able to look really well at, at trends prior to policy implementation, which is something that optimally one wants to do in difference and difference analyses, so that's a limitation I need to note. We don't know anything about the quality of the services the kids are receiving or the clinical outcomes. And so getting services is nice, but that's only half the battle, right? You need to have effective services and you want to see outcomes. Um, and we also don't have information about other things that may be going on in the states that may also be increasing access. Although so, since states were implementing these programs at different times, it seems unlikely to us that there are other policies being implemented at exactly the same time that could be driving our findings. Um, so the bottom line, these programs seem to matter. They seem to work. So it's actually encouraging that the federal government appears to be investing in them. Um, that said, we continue to have a real problem in this country about kids getting mental health services they need. Um, and I, I think one of the things that this drives home to me and this entire conference does, this is not a silver bullet. There's probably not a silver bullet for this issue, but there may be a lot of silver buckshot, right? We, we, we may need multiple interventions at multiple levels to really be able to solve this problem. Um, the other thing that I will point out, given the audience, is given the fact that there is likely to be a substantial expansion of these programs, and we know it's coming, may I point out that I believe NIMH still has a mechanism for rapid evaluation of proposals having to do with policy changes, such as this one, that would facilitate a much more robust and rigorous analysis of the effectiveness of these types of programs. Both are they doing, what are they doing in terms of services and are they affecting those types of outcomes? 
So I went very quickly. I tried to leave a couple, a little bit of time for questions, and there may be some time at the end. Um, it's tight, but does anyone have any comments or questions very quickly? When I saw your abstract title three days ago, I was like, please let it work. Please let it work. <laughs> well, let's get in this game. But uh, actually, it'd be interesting to maybe use Medicaid data to, to, to do some quality uh, investigations in the states and implement it, you know, uh, more than one antipsychotic at a time. Some of the stuff that you might be able to at least do crude quality measures. Yep. Yeah. Great idea. And I think the idea of bringing multiple data sources to understand different aspects of the program is really the next stage of this. Do you have any information about um, whether there are greater gaps in access for, say, like younger children with lower acuity mental health needs versus older children with more intense acuity needs, or is that clinical information not available from this data? This data doesn't really have that. Okay. Um, I, I, my sense is that these aren't going to be the high, high-end kids, right? They're going to the high, high-end kids generally find their way either into the specialty mental health system or into the child welfare or juvenile justice system. Let, let's be honest, right? That's where they're gonna get treatment. So I think for those really, really sick kids, this isn't the program. This is the program for the kids who pediatricians probably can manage, but haven't traditionally felt comfortable doing so. All right, I'm seeing I'm getting the red light. Thank you very much. Okay. And next up, we have Dr. Van Voorhees. Thank you. Let's get it on. Let's to, um, but it's, it's actually not showing as a, as a slideshow. Just hold on. Let's just click this one. Okay. Oh, okay. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to present a randomized clinical trial of a population-based approach to prevent adolescent depressive episodes in primary care using a technology-based behavioral vaccine, uh, the PASS study on 12-month outcomes. Um, and I know that's a long title, and I think it tries to capture several concepts. What I'll try to, um, after hearing the conference and hearing uh, Bradley's just wonderful introduction to this, this, this dimension of, um, of the enormous unmet unmet need for adolescent health services. I try to kind of go back through this presentation and really capture some of the some of the big concepts I think that emerged over the course of the of the last two days and then try to work them into the presentation. So first of all just to acknowledge the, the funding support for the National Institute of Mental Health that funded the trial, also funded the, the K Award that supported the initial work on the project. Uh, I did work as a consultant helping other organizations with these kinds of projects up into 2011, but I have no current, current relationships. So I thought I would just ask, you know, start with some high concept questions like, you know, why would we approach uh, preventing depression through a population health-based model in primary care? Uh, I think the first premise is that, or the first element dilemma is that congestive disorders are common and have a long tail of life course morbidity. Prevention may reduce um, this morbidity and be made more, may be more cost effective than treatment, potentially, or waiting until sick enough to be treated. And current face-to-face current -face preventive interventions are efficacious, but they may, may not be scalable in the primary care environment. Why? Many of them are wonderful face-to-face um, -face, uh, programs. It's hard to organize groups. There may not be enough therapists available. They may be too expensive, or it may be that in 12 sessions of psychotherapy in a group is just too much for the idea of being at risk for depression for many primary care patients. So the technology-based behavioral vaccine, which is really developed from Embry's idea of a behavioral vaccine, is a, a scalable, low-cost, potentially efficacious alternative to these face-to-face -face models. Um, I thought as those of you are you know, applying this course of trying to you know, get funding and then develop these technology models, we heard a lot about you know, contextualizing these interventions, develop them, developing them with the end use in mind. And I thought I'd just trace out this process which began in, 
in actually 2002 when I was a fellow at Johns Hopkins and really is ongoing today. But I tried to capture in red how we tried to learn something at each level of intervention uh, through fee three phases of development uh, at this point about what the users really want, what the practice wants. So there was just a constant feedback loop between the teen users of these, of these interventions, the primary care practice where they're interviewing them. So ideally, we would end up at the end on the far right with an ideally an efficacious intervention that would be scalable and acceptable to youth and at a, at a modest cost. So how did, so what, you know, what, what really, what really, what really constitutes a technology-based vaccine or a intervention that could be contextualized into primary care? Um, I think one of the things that, you know, I think has been brought up and discussed at Dr. Moore's talk is, you know, the standalone interventions are not as, as effect or efficacious as interventions that are contextualized as human contact. If you want to place these within a health system, you really have to start with the effective components. That is, that is the face-to-face -face interventions that we know that work have to be moved into a web-based format. You have to have a framework for motivation because, as Dr. Moore alluded to, the utilization can be very low of these interventions without some sort of human context. And then finally, there has to be an implementation structure in primary care if you're going to actually put them in primary care and actually to identify the population at risk and actually implement these programs at scale. And they all have to be really brought together and continuously revised. And just to, for those of us that have a therapeutic background, just to note, um, you know, there, we started with um, evidence-based components, um, and we meshed them with a motivational system, which in this case, in this trial, is a motivational interview. Uh, we tried to understand the theory, the epidemiology, and the brain science so that we'd have a mechanism at the end, which we know is very important, what Dr. Fried said, in terms of un the NIMH's portfolio and, um, and uh, approach to interventions research. So briefly, we did a phase one through two clinical trials with foundation funding and a K award to help the catch the intervention that's competent adulthood transition with cognitive behavioral, humanistic, and interpersonal training. Um, briefly, we conducted this phase two clinical trial from 2007 to 2011. There were 83 participants. The main object of the trial was to establish the, the appropriate um, mechanism of motivation. And that, that mechanism of motivation would both be efficacious in engaging youth with a website, but also would not be excessively burdensome for the physician who would be implementing it in primary care. We trialed out motivational, uh, in a motivation interview plus catch it, the online intervention uh, versus brief advice plus catch it. And essentially, what we demonstrated was the motivation interview was uh, demonstrated uh, superiority over brief advice in terms of usage of the website, uh, level of motivation. And surprisingly, it also appeared to demonstrate superiority in number of episodes at a year. This is a very soft outcome, but basically this is clinician-diagnosed episodes of, of, of major depression. And in that trial, there were about, in, at, a, at a year, there were about six, it was about 7 to 8% in the, in the motivation interview group, but it was almost 30% um, in, in the brief advice group. So therefore, when we went to the third generation trial, uh, the motivation of you plus catch it was the model to be used, and we felt we could justify the additional work on the primary care physicians. So this is the phase three clinical trial funded by the R01 from the NIMH. Uh, the aims of, this, aims of this are, one, it's really uh, a time to event study. Uh, the, the outcome we used in this study was DSR-3 and above. For those that are not familiar with the, this, the DSR rating system or, or, or scoring system, this would essentially mean minor, you know, I would say minor depression with meaningful impairment or major depression or severe major depression, essentially. So I would say clinically meaningful outcomes to patients. The second aim was, does it have superiority over um, a health education? We'll describe this uh, an attention control for depressed mood and functional status. And then finally, uh, uh, what are the uh, moderating and mediating factors in the outcomes? So this is the study design. It's a little hard to read, but I want to just first draw your attention to the middle of the slide. The two groups were catch it versus health education. So catch at this point in this construction had 14 modules for the teenager uh, based on those therapeutic models I described, but we added in actually a parent intervention, which is the beardsley glastone family talk model. Uh, these were all incarnated into an online, online format that had high fidelity to the original, um, um, the original, the original manuals. 
on the, your right, you can see health education. There was a full attention control. That means there were 14 modules in the health education teen program and five modules in the parent exact match, basically. These were drawn from the well child curriculum. They're drawn from a study that was used in, actually in Australia and then meshed with the American Academy of Pediatrics well child guidelines. If you go to the top of it, what you'll see is the way we identified patients, and we'll go into this further, further was through, the, through letter outreach and screening in primary care. So we actually fielded the actual case acquisition in a public health format, going out and finding the individuals at risk. Then we did an eligibility assessment, a consenting process, and then they were randomized to the two groups, and then were followed for two years, both with self-reports and structured psychiatric interviews. So we had the hard outcome of time to event. So briefly, you know, and back to what is a behavioral vaccine, so what, how, how do we actually um, create an intervention that was, you know, had a delivery system, which you can see in the far left below, that would actually be appealing to teenagers. And this is definitely a, an artistic form for which we had to recruit um, or engage many people younger than myself to assist in this. Um, this third generation intervention, uh, you know, was the most, um, complex one we'd ever designed. It was designed specifically to increase the interact, interaction between the teenager and the website. We thought this would, or we believe this would increase the efficacy. That is, we defined um, interaction in term, increased interaction in, in them typing more material into the re website in response to questions, basically. And we did this through um, a queries, um, responses that would get back from the actual program itself, and then finally, the use of parasocial learning with video clips from adolescents, adolescent actors to um, simulate the different techniques we wanted to teach. Health education was the attention control intervention. I have to admit, we did try to make it as unexciting as we could. <laughs> um, I will just say to our surprise, uh, we got lots of very positive reviews of health education. Um, interesting, they, they described Catch It as being really good and great for their families, but very, but a lot of work. Whereas they said health education was really easy to do and it felt very satisfying to complete. So I think in the sense of, you know, really engaging families with two interventions they saw as peer interventions, this, this study was quite successful. So in terms of study eligibility, there were several criteria. We tried to match the prevention of depression study, which was the major efficacy study of a face-to-face of a -face group therapy model. Um, essentially, 13 to 18 years old, uh, no current depressive episodes, um, no significant level of substance abuse, which we thought would uh, make the F CBT ineffective. And the, uh, they had to have a CSD score that was elevated. And then finally, minimal suicidal ideation and um, uh, no prior CBT or IPT. Um, and now, how do we actually go about fielding this? So we actually did this in vivo. We did this trial actually in primary care environments. So believe it or not, we actually enrolled 1,200 healthcare providers, that's nurses, MAs, practice managers. As you'll see, they were in 32 different sites, five health systems, four different IRBs, all of which uh, claimed complete autonomy over their sites. That means every, all 64 amendments had to go through all four our IRBs before they could be implemented. So it's very complicated administratively um, to, to manage this study, but nonetheless, it, we, we completed it. Um, we actually, in this site, we, we, we were able to get patient registries and determine there were about 41,500 adolescents in the 32 practices. So we had the denominator, which as, you noted, as was noted in one of the earlier presentations is a real problem. If we're just selecting for 0.001% of the population of highly motivated people, how are we ever going to close the gap for mental health services because we're not really engaging children that wouldn't use interventions otherwise. So in this case, um, we did publish uh, what, we, what we estimate is the reach. We believe we engaged about 17% of the population at risk. That is, the individuals in these practices who were at risk for developing major depression during the two years we were actually in the practices. What you can see is we, um, we touched about 40,000 individuals with letters. We actually screened 8,000 individuals. Um, we then, this is a long cascade down, we eventually interviewed 2,500 on the phone. We uh, actually enrolled 446, and we randomized 369, which was 93% of the uh, anticipated or planned enrollment. 
Study results. So uh, the first important thing is there were no significant differences between the health ed and the Skatchit uh, intervention group assignments. So the randomization was essentially successful. We were successful in dipping into a different population. 47% of the fathers did not have college, were not college graduates. More than 50% were ethnic minority youth. I can tell you that we were in some of the poorest and most violent neighborhoods in Chicago, and we were some of the most astonishingly affluent areas of the north side of Chicago, and that was also true in, in Boston, although it was a skewed to a somewhat more educated population in Boston. So in terms of study participation or fidelity, um, um, with the, the motivation interview completion, that would have been the catch side only was 73%. We did do, have done fidelity scoring, I would just say, it, I would call it adequate. Uh, but not astonishing levels of performance by the physicians. In terms of time on site, the average time on site was, the mean time on site was 94 minutes for Catch It. Uh, health Ed was 19 minutes. Uh, for the parents, it was about an hour on, uh, on, on Catch It and about um, 20 minutes on, on Health Ed. So on Catch It, you know, the operative intervention in this case in terms of the therapeutic model, there was about three hours of total family contact with the, interven with the intervention alone, excluding uh, time in motivational interviews. Uh, the cat with, in terms of cat, 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 characters typed, it was actually exceeded the prior study. I really had two minutes. We better speed up. Okay, outcomes. Okay, this is the intention to treat. This is one year out. Um, and I put the, the p values you can see under six and 12 months. You can essentially see that um, there's a trend favoring, if you want to, I'm using, over, over claiming that term, favoring uh, catch it, which is the blue line. Uh, red is health ed out to. Um, 12, out to, out to about six to nine months, but it's not statistically significant. If you go to actually uh, down to per protocol two, that's both groups doing two, two modules each. The groups were essentially identical, although you, know, you break the randomization. It was significant at six months, but not at 12 months. Um, the incidence of depressive episodes was smaller than uh, anticipated. If you look at here, that basically in health, that only 10% had a major depressive episode, 6% on catch it. We anticipated actually in the, in the usual care group, there would be about 16% at one year. And actually catch it was what we thought. It was exactly what it had been in the, in the, in the original dosing trial. Uh, so test aim two, I'll just say CSG scores did not vary by group. They did vary somewhat by site. They declined in both groups significantly across time. Same with gas scores, they increased significantly across time, but did not vary by group. And then finally, moderation. Uh, these are a little hard to see. We didn't explore, uh, you know, essentially did ad hoc explorations of for whom this might possibly be beneficial. Uh, what I'll just say in synopsis is that you, you can see is catch it on the left, health ed on the right. Your le the line falling lower is worse. It means you're more likely to develop a depressed mood. And what you can see is for individuals who had depressed mood at baseline, there could actually be fairly dramatic, if you look at the purple line, dramatic reductions in risk. This was a statistically significant moderation at six months, and, and it was as well at 12 months, but in a, in a subgroup that included only those who were enrolled with a depressed mood at baseline, which was still the vast majority of the sample. This is actually a list of parent modules. What this shows is that the parents completed at least, completed all the modules at 12 months with a p-value of 0.08, so it's a trend. Uh, there was a 50% reduction in risk for the teens, so there's a dosing effect. We then looked at gas scores and CSC, and what we found, this is a complicated one to interpret, but basically it's an interaction term. If you can see this on the, uh, yeah, on the y-axis, you, you have functional status or CSD score, on the x-axis, you have modules completed. Um, the dotted line is health ed, the, the slanted line, the solid line is catch it. What you can see is there's a linear relationship between modules completed and functional status. But you have to do about five modules to beat health ed. Similar with gas scores, again, a linear relationship between modules completed and catch it and having a higher gas score at 12 months, pretty much uh, no relationship for health ed, just suggesting therapeutic elements. So finally, there were other results. Um, there was a borderline result, reduction in self-harm for catch it a borderline reduction in substance abuse, increased sociocultural relevance and the catch it arm, you know, they thought it was more useful for preventing depression, and higher levels of uh, motivation for prevention. Um, in terms of the strengths and limitations, um, <clears throat> you know, essentially we recruited a diverse sample, fielded multiple practices. The limitations, we lost quite a few to fall up, 25% at 12 months, although it was pretty good at six months. Um, Self-reports were often not completed. And I just want to say that we used pretty much the current GLAD PC guidelines. Everybody in the study on both arms got very robust referral screening, uh, repeat assessments, phone counseling. So there's a very robust overall intervention on both sides. So interestingly enough, while we were doing this, this is the easiest trial I ever conducted. 
Halfway through recruiting this cohort, I got an email from China saying I'd been there three years ago, they, and we had translated the intervention with them. They said, believe it or not, we finished our clinical trial, it's done, and catch it in Chinese language actually beats an attention control for a depressed mood of 12 months. Would you like to be on the paper? So it's, I included this because I think it's kind of interesting. They did not have any human contact. It was purely you went to the website, and it was catch it straight up against an attention control. Conclusions. Um, what I think we're looking at is partially two effects. You know, this GLAD PC or kind of chronic care model, you know, may actually decrease the overall incidence of depression. That may explain why the usual care group or the attention control actually had a relatively low incidence of depressed, depressed episodes at a year. Catch it, um, you know, may reduce the um, level of depression at 12 months if it's compared against a control group that has no human contact. Um, it may increase motivation and reduce self-harm and substance abuse compared to attention control. And then looking at kind of moderation, it, um, it, may, it, may, it may reduce incidence of depressive episodes for those who have higher risk at baseline, which is most of the kids in the trial. And it may, um, it may uh, complete, um, it, it, if you complete sufficient numbers of modules, it may actually improve uh, functional status and depressed mood and potentially outcomes. And that's it, sorry. <laughs> that was too many slides. <laughs> It is the end of the day, so I'm hoping that um, if our panel is available, they can stick around for questions afterwards. Whoops, I've got the wrong one here. Is yours on here? The end? Have you loaded your phone? Um, we should probably talk to the folks in the back, but in the meantime. I have my email address. Yeah. So in the meantime, can we move on to, to Dr. Philip Cheng? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I'm very excited to be here um, and very excited that you all are still here. I will be talking about depression, but also about sleep, which is a little different um, from what you're maybe used to hearing. I have no um, conflicts of interest that are relevant, uh, although I do have funding that's not related to this study. So sleep is very much um, connected to our entire human system, including uh, are all different organs as well as mental health. Um, and so it's not all that surprising to think about insomnia, which is a sleep disorder, being also connected to our mental health. And this is a, a busy table from an old study, um, but I'll here just highlight the important part. Um, as you can see here, this is a study prospectively predicting um, on the left-hand side, you see major depression, anxiety, dis anxiety disorders, alcohol abuse, as well as any psychiatric disorders. And the main point here is that um, group two, which is uh, insomnia at time one and no insomnia at time two, which is uh, where psychiatric, uh, psychiatric disorders were assessed, the odds ratios are all greater than one, meaning that insomnia greatly predicts or um, predicts the onset um, of psychiatric disorders, including any psychiatric disorder in the DSM, and at this point I believe it was the DSM-3, so it's a little outdated. Um, but today I'll be focusing on depression. And this is another study, so this, the, these findings are very robust. It's, they've been replicated several times, and you can see here a Kaplan-Meier plot of people with and without insomnia um, and their odds of uh, developing depression, and here the relative risk ratio is basically two, meaning that those with insomnia are at twice the risk of developing depression as those who do not. Um, Importantly, insomnia is a modifiable risk factor for depression, okay? And uh, like I said, there's been a lot of research going on to show this, and very excitingly, um, this year a systematic review came out um, looking at nine total different studies with 440 total participants, six RCTs, um, and basically the conclusion is that CBT for insomnia can have treatment effects of roughly the same magnitude of antidepressant medications, but with fewer side effects and contraindications. And this is, I think, very exciting news. Um, 
because there's we've got a um, two two birds with one stone kind of a deal, um, and it's really hard to resist the impulse to say this is great. Let's get this out to everyone who has insomnia who later will develop depression. Um, but there is one problem, one big problem, and that problem is akin to hearing about not just a pizza party, but a raging pizza party, and inviting all your very hungry friends to this, except when you show up, there really isn't enough pizza to go around. Um, and this is a very sad feeling. You can almost hear the sad trombones playing in the background. The reality is that there's about 1,200 CBTI providers in the US. Uh, and if you think about the, uh, insomnia prevalence at about 10% of the population, you get one provider to about 27,000 people. Uh, I don't care how good your RVUs are, this is literally impossible to achieve. Um, so we have a big problem on our hands, but we also live in the age of technology, so of course we have an app for it. Why should we go digital? Well, the digital version of, the, of CBT for insomnia is just very similar to the face-to-face -face version. There's six to eight sessions, except there's no clinician involvement whatsoever. It is internet accessible, which should mean that it's highly scalable. And it's also cost effective even without insurance. And I will say that the app that we're using is actually on the market. You can go and download it right now. Um, and so this is immediately available. Our research has already shown that digital CBTI is efficacious for both insomnia and depression. So here you see on the um, x-axis pretreatment and post-treatment, and then on the y-axis the ISI or the insomnia severity scale, and you see that in the um, black solid line, digital CBTI does confer additional improvements above sleep education. We see a very similar trend with the, this is depression symptomatology on the y-axis, particularly with the QIDs, without the sleep symptoms in there. And so you see basically a 50% reduction in non-sleep-related depression symptomology severity uh, after treatment. And we're not the first people to demonstrate this. Uh, like I said, this has been replicated quite widely. So our research question for today is, can digital CBTI actually go above and beyond treating depression but preventing incident depression in those with insomnia? And also, how might other functional outcomes be impacted? Uh, we did this through a randomized controlled trial. We randomized uh, through simple randomization um, people to either the digital CBTI or the sleep education condition, which I'll describe in a little bit. We enrolled uh, 1,386 participants, 658 who completed the treatment. And the outcome measures were uh, the QEDs. And in particular, we were interested in looking at uh, QID um, as a measure of depression using cutoff cut of 10. And in particular, we wanted to follow those who did not have depression at baseline, so people with 10 or less at baseline. And this provided our a sam final sample of 339. Um, we also looked at ISI. And here are other functional outcomes. Uh, these are our groups, so we ended up with 185 with no depression at baseline in the digital CBTI condition and 154 in the sleep education condition. Predominantly female, um, mostly comparable across different demographics. The digital CBTI intervention are six weekly sessions accessed through either website or the app with an animated therapist with sleep diaries, and here you see week one through week six. Um, and the idea is that it draws on three different components, behavioral, cognitive, and educational um, behaviorals, including le using learning principles, uh, cognitive components, including cognitive restructuring and mindfulness, um, and then an educational component, including sleep hygiene. And this directly con um, corresponds to our online sleep education, which is six weekly emails with sleep hygiene tips. If you're not familiar with sleep hygiene, this is what you get when you go see your primary care provider when you have a sleep problem. The doctor says, uh, don't drink caffeine, um, make sure you uh, sleep in a dark room, things like that. And there's a lot of evidence to show that this is not an effective standalone treatment for insomnia. But it's a great attention control. So here are our results. Um, on the x-axis, you see post-treatment and 12-month follow-up. 
um, no pretreatment because no one had depression at pretreatment. And then on the y-axis, you had incidence of depression based on QIDs of greater than 10. In the sleep education condition, you see about an 11% incident rate at post-treatment versus a 6%. Um, whereas at 12-month follow-up, this is cumulative. So at a year after treatment, 20% in the sleep education condition, and that is significantly different from post-treatment. And then in the C DCBTI condition, you see a 10%, and that is also significant compared to sleep education. Uh, this basically creates a risk ratio of about 0.5, uh, and the number needed to treat is about 10, meaning to, uh, to prevent one case of depression, you would only need to treat 10 individuals. Uh, with a subscription price of $300 per year, this is an investment of $3,000 per year to um, prevent one case of depression, which I think is pretty neat. Um, in looking at the relationship between depression and insomnia, we also looked at um, how incident depression related to uh, response to treatment in terms of insomnia. And here on the left, you see in the digital CBTI condition, those with no incident depression had much greater of a reduction in insomnia severity, and the same trend exists in the sleep education condition, although the, their insomnia did not improve as much as would be expected. All right, in terms of functional outcomes, we looked at several different um, domains. In terms of productivity, uh, we see a reduction in um, absenteeism at both post-treatment and follow-up in the digital CBTI condition, whereas that trend did not pan out in sleep education. In terms of productivity during work, that's what the scale called presenteeism, you see an re initial reduction at post-treatment. It creeps back up, but certainly stays lower than um, pre-treatment, whereas uh, that uh, pattern is less uh, dominant in the sleep education condition. Social functioning, here we have frequency of social contacts, and you'll see here, uh, and I should say these errors are 95% confidence intervals. Um, so in the digital CBTI condition, you see uh, increase uh, of frequency of social contacts, whereas that's not the case in sleep education. In terms of number of, of supportive relationships, similar trend between the two groups. And then in terms of actually measuring the amount of strain in the relationships, you see a significant decrease in the digital CBTI condition um, and not so in the sleep education condition. With cognitive function, we see the similar thing with worry and preservative thinking, both decreases in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, the digital version that stays low. Um, and in fact, we also see this effect in resilience. People are reporting more resilience um, if you're in the digital CBTI group at both follow-up time points. So this to us seems pretty promising uh, in that a digitally de delivered CBTI app can prevent incident depression in those with insomnia. This is particularly exciting for two reasons. One is that prevention of depression is very difficult to achieve. Um, in particular, depression we can think of as progressive in that having more uh, episodes predicts more episodes later on. Um, but perhaps one, one of the things we're doing when we're building up sleep health is maybe even building resilience. Um, and of course, we're all familiar with the economic burdens, burdens of chronic depression. The other thing is that digital CBTI is actually very well aligned with preventing um, depression or just prevention in general because it's widely accessible and it's low cost. Um, and in fact, we're now starting to implement this in a step care model within primary care and we have um, an NIMH funding to do that. Um, in primary care is important because in essence all the historical and um, existing efforts mostly include early detection um, and uh, treating early symptoms, which really gets at mostly tertiary or secondary preventions, whereas with this step care model, we may start to move closer towards primary prevention, which uh, is obviously much more desirable. So with that, I will just acknowledge my mentor and our staff, as well as uh, funding more for myself, as well as for the future direction of these studies. And we have, looks like, a little less than three minutes for questions, so I will take any if there are.
Thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. I'm Beth Bowers at NIMH. Um, for the people that use the digital version, mm -hmm. do you have any information on whether or not they continue to use it, continue to access it, as opposed to those that just had education and whether or not they continued to use it? Yeah, so there are a select few who, um, they have access for up to a year so they can continue to use it, and, um, but we haven't really done any analysis on that and we can certainly look, but yes, yeah. Um, thanks for this really interesting talk. I have two questions. Okay. My first question is if you can give the name of the app. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. It my <laughs> yes. It's called Sleepio. S L E E P I O. I O. Yes. And you're saying it costs $300 a year? Or I believe it is. I believe it's a $300 subscription right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what you think of is the difference with that app versus just those that are publicly available? The, um, the, the difference is, I think, the amount of science behind it. This, right. The Sleepio um, program was developed by a uh, expert in CBTI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, there are a couple others out there. Um, there may be slight differences in terms of the ordering of things, and this one has a very particular style with a Scottish animated therapist, so there may be like interface differences there, but um, I think the evidence is pretty standard. CBTI is a manualized treatment, so you probably won't find too many differences there. Okay, um, and then my other question is, it seems like you had pretty, engage pretty good engagement with people recruited to this study versus other uh, online CBT apps and programs, it's hard to get people to complete all the yes. modules like Dr. Angor, he's was saying about Catch It and everything. Yes. I yep. was wondering what you think that difference is from. Is it because um, insomnia is such a, you know, has a high perceived severity for somebody who's being absent to work and it's more affecting their life and they see kind of how it relates to their problem or what mm -hmm. do you think there? Yeah, so, so I, I would probably say that um, First of all, I think we, we actually recruited twice the amount of people into CBTI knowing that we would have a higher drop-off rate, and then we did. We see about twice the amount of attrition in our CBTI group. So I, I'm not sure if uh, our sample is really that much more highly engaged, but um, one thing that we did try and do to improve attrition is to follow, follow up with people who seem to be sort of rolling behind a little bit, and that seemed to help a little bit. But that's not like a that was part of the research study, yes. Yeah. So, so anything, I, I would say that the processes that um, make internet delivered therapy difficult um, still is at play here, although because it's just six to eight sessions, it may be a little less burdensome. But you, you still think there should be a hearing? Um, uh, if you're trying to reduce attrition, yes, that, that, that did help, yeah. Glad we got this worked out. So, next up we have Dr. Bennett. Hi, everyone. The uh, the brave, the few that are still here at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, so, my name is Ian Bennett. I'm uh, in the departments of family medicine and psychiatry at the University of Washington, and I am uh, going to be talking about my favorite topic, which is how to get the evidence-based model of uh, collaborative care into practices providing uh, services for women in pregnancy and postpartum. Um, the particular area that I'm interested in and be talking about today is the integration of a advanced healthcare uh, patient registry into um, an existing comprehensive electronic health record to facilitate that work of collaborative care. Um, I'll be presenting some results of an ongoing trial. Um, this is actually not the goal of the trial, um, but this is an out, uh, one of the spin-offs of the work. Um, we're uh, carrying out a randomized cluster, uh, cluster randomized trial nationally for implementing collaborative care for per perinatal depression. I'll pr be presenting results of our um, initial year, which was actually building that registry to facilitate the trial that would go on and the results of, um, and also results with six, uh, the initial six sites that were, um, that we carried out the work in. 
Um, so my partners include folks in psychiatry, including Jürgen Unitzer, Amy Bauer, Amritha Bhatt, and other folks um, from that department, as well as Ocean Incorporated, which is a, a health IT network uh, that is national. It's a, they have a shared EHR uh, for community health centers across the country. It's about 350 members um, in uh, about 17 states across the country. Um, and those are the sites from which we were recruiting for this particular trial. Um, the folks that did the qualitative work for this uh, research were at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Fran Barg and Whitney Erickson. So just a quick reminder of what the collaborative care schematic would be. That it, um, the idea is that it's a team-based approach in which there is the addition of a, of a role, which is the care manager that is, uh, mani that is managing a panel of patients um, that have been identified to, as having risk or ha having depression, common mental disorders, depression, anxiety. Um, and there is a weekly uh, case review, um, panel review, using uh, by a psychiatric consultant um, who has skills and b has been trained to do that. Um, that uh, results in input on a panel of patients and the, the, who are having a range of responses to initial treatments, um, including the uh, modification of treatments and in, uh, input on um, uh, treatment options for patients as they are on the registry. Um, so, and the, uh, uh, the um, key back for that schematic is in order to be able to manage that group of patients, um, it's key to have a tool that allows you to keep track of those patients. Um, an advanced chronic care registry um, is distinct from um, an electronic health record, a comprehensive electronic health record, which is uh, generally individual patient oriented um, rather than population oriented, although there, um, there's no, not a clear distinction between those two. Um, there are um, some important components of it. Um, we uh, know that uh, having a, um, a patient, a disease specific electronic um, or uh, electronic registry of uh, patients that is oriented towards the needs of that particular disorder uh, improves outcomes in both uh, physical and mental health chronic care. Um, there is evidence that the uh, quality of the care goes up along with the actual clinical outcomes, so there seems to be a strong association or mechanism of the registry um, actually improving care, which then goes on to improve outcomes. Um, it's distinct from an EHR in that it is disease specific it, rather than comprehensive, um, provides individual patient and population reports so you can know about that whole group of patients, uh, metrics about how that patient uh, population is doing. It allows for monitoring work at the provider as well as the site level in addition to the patient level. Um, and includes uh, smart elements, meaning um, uh, notifications um, that, uh, that allow you to prioritize patients based on their uh, need for review because they um, have not had improvements, for example, or they have more severe symptoms, um, and um, includes a num number of different ways of getting those reminders. It also facilitates the uh, case review. That's a, a critical component. So while there are a range of registries um, available now through electronic health records, they uh, do not um, include these smart elements. And so we decided in our case, in order to uh, move forward with the registry, uh, with the trial, that we wanted to build a uh, registry that incorporated functionalities that have been proven to be useful. Um, these are um, another more comprehensive list of advanced registry components. It uh, attracts population-based care, allows you to monitor patients through treatment history, symptom tracking um, over, the, over treatment, monitoring caseloads, monitoring populations, having reminders, um, uh, supporting case review, uh, supporting treatment to target, so uh, enhancing the ability to um, to keep on in, uh, changing doses, and increasing doses, et cetera, and allowing also the documentation and communication between the, um, the members of the clinical team. Okay, 
This is a, 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 a picture of the CMTS um, system, which was developed over uh, 15 years um, through at the Ames Center at the University of Washington. It incorporates all those functionalities that I was just mentioning. Um, we, this is, these are not live patients, but a, a sample of, uh, of names that, in, but you can see various things like the, the fact that there is a list of patients with a list of, sim, of uh, various kinds of symptoms and other clinical outcomes. In this case, it's a version that includes uh, hemoglobin A1C, so diabetes and blood pressure and, and uh, lipid uh, metrics um, for that particular trial. They were interested in those. Um, it allows you to track contacts and the symptom scores across time on the far left. Well, you'll see that there are various colors. Um, that allows you to visually identify and prioritize patients that for review. On the left, there's a, there's a flag column, which is an example of a way for both the um, uh, care manager and the psychiatric consultant to identify cases that they wanted to review. Okay, so our study goals were to build this functional care registry in, for perinatal depression right into an ambulatory EHR, uh, to implement the tool in sites implementing team-based care for perinatal depression and then assess its utility, um, both is in terms of perceived usability and appropriateness and the actual use of the registry, its initiation, its uh, sustained use and appropriate use, use of so fidelity to what we'd expect. Um, we are, there's a partnership between these various entities, the, um, the AIM Center, uh, the folks at Ocean. Uh, we used end user design principles and rapid iterative design principles over time to create this um, version within the uh, Ocean Epic. Uh, version uh, Epic is the, is the brand of the, um, the, uh, of the uh, EHR that was, it was built into, but it's an instance which is specific to the Ocean organization. Um, this is a timeline that shows um, over uh, our overall development period starting in uh, May of 2016 um, and ending in March of 2018 uh, for the final version 2.0 of the registry. Version 1.0 was created before we started um, recruiting patient uh, practices, I should say, um, and included uh, iterative design uh, uh, sessions, 20 in all, with uh, an average number of nine participants in the design uh, sessions, um, and generally one to two um, design sessions per month, which is facilitated by remote work uh, through video meetings. Uh, we had um, proto users who carried out prototype testing. There were four unique users. Um, these were uh, care managers from other uh, collaborative care efforts that were using the, that had used CMTS for many years and now we're testing the prototypes within the EPIC system. Um, we implemented from Feb uh, March, actually, of 2017 through um, through uh, July to August of 2017 within six uh, sites that are doing prenatal care that included training with in-person training and coaching support, practice facilitation. Um, we, car we carried out testing and feedback with both the users and the coaches that were um, we're using the system. We then went through a enhancement um, identification process where there was identification of possible improvements um, and then a prioritization by the users on what they wanted to actually be changed. Um, and then the final version 2.0 was uh, completed in January of 2018. We carried out two evaluations that I'll be showing you data for, one at six months after initiation of implementation and one at 12 months, so after version 1.0 was in place and version 2.0. Um, so what are the, um, the results in, in general in the domains that I mentioned? In terms of uh, the actual functionalities, you see uh, what the requirements were, um, the functionalities that were actually put into place. Um, all of them um, were achieved with the exception of quality improvement reports, so population level reporting right out of the functionality itself. That was not achieved um, because of limitations of the data structure in the EHR um, so in, to the satisfaction of what we wanted to be able to actually drive um, implementation. So that is being uh, generated, pulling data from several sources in order to be able to provide the quality improvement data that we um, feel is necessary for the implementation. 
Um, in terms of usability, uh, we use the system usability score, which is a standard uh, a brief survey to, that assesses the overall usability, a score of 68 uh, or 67, above 67. So 68 or above was considered above average usability. Um, and what we found was that there were um, three of the, f uh, um, and four of the five um, sites that were reporting at, our at six months um, had above average um, usability, whereas um, uh, three of the five had above average usability at 12 months. So um, after version one, there was, um, in both cases, the majority felt that they had above average usability, but there were exceptions to that. And I wouldn't really emphasize too much the average. Obviously, this is a small sample. It's more about you know, the individual um, sites, and we had some qualitative information in general indicating that they um, that this was a uh, useful and, a, and appreciated tool, um, but there were some difficulties such as the complexity and the need for training to uh, actually utilize it. Reminiscent of EHR efforts in general and trying to get people to use EHRs. Um, so within the domains, we have some qualitative um, I I evidence indicating for acceptability. Um, there was broad acceptability of the tool and um, feeling of appropriateness. 100% um, uh, of the sites had implemented and were using the registries within six weeks of, um, of uh, the training in um, using the, uh, when we expected them to be able to potentially start using it. Um, with regard to penetration, between 35 and 100% of eligible patients, meaning those that were screen positive, that should have been put on the registry, uh, were put on the registry in the first three months of the trial, so there was initial, um, initial utilization of appropriate patients. Um, fidelity, sustainability, and clinical outcomes, I'll show you um, some actual graphics here. Um, this is, uh, we were interested in seeing if people had sustained use of the registry over time. This is the metric you know, I'm showing you here. Uh, the total number of patients on the registries cumulatively are shown in the, uh, on the right. Um, and they, um, we, you can see that there, for um, all of the cases, there was continued additions of patients to the registry over time. Um, uh, one site which had a, a higher patient volume um, had uh, more patients added over time. So there seemed to be continued use of the registry from that measure. Another measure was actual contacts, so are, are the uh, pay, the uh, care managers actually reaching out and then documenting their contacts with patients over time. Um, we had uh, sites that had minimal contacts, uh, including one that really stopped uh, participating in the uh, trial fairly early, um, but um, others, four of the, the six, had some substantial use of, or some use of the um, a documenting contacts in the registry or for the full period. And this uh, period includes a 12-month implementation um, and then nine-month uh, sustainment phase. Um, and the same thing here with regard to clinical outcomes. Uh, the, this is the uh, number or proportion of patients who had a 50% or greater reduction in PHQ9 scores um, after 10 weeks of being treated, which is a, one of our standard measures of outcomes. So I just wanted to, of course, keep an eye, is, there, is the system working in some way that we would think would be acceptable? We, uh, our goal is, for, is greater than 40% of patients dropping um, below 50%, so above 40% is better, is achieving the goal, and you see that's um, all but one of our sites um, had for a substantial period of time above that threshold. So um, we're, the goal of this particular data is not to show that anything about efficacy of, uh, of collaborative care, but just to show that we are, we seem to be uh, implementing and the registry seems to be associated with both use and uh, clinical outcomes. So uh, with regard to what we can say so far, we've created, successfully created a patient registry, registry within an ambulatory EHR, which utilizes the, fun the key functionalities of the uh, longstanding um, e uh, registry that had been a third party for, uh, uh, form for many years. Um, and um, uh, they, it was utilized and had uh, reasonable, um, uh, reasonable usability scores. 
So we're going to go on to make sure that uh, we're studying better the actual, how do we get people to actually implement this thing and sustainably use it. Um, and we'll see how uh, that analysis is required. And we need larger samples, of course, for that. Thank you. Any clarifying questions? <laughs> So last and certainly not least, we have Dr. Patel. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sapana Patel, and I'm in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University. And I'll be talking um, with you all today about a pilot implementation program of an ICBT, internet-based CBT for OCD program um, that we conducted with our colleagues at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, There we go, okay. So you don't often hear about obsessive compulsive disorder at services research conferences, and so I'm hoping that the next couple of slides will convince you about why we should hear about it more. Um, OCD is a disabling disorder. Um, it, it consists of the experience of obsessions and compulsions, and what an individual goes through is, is either um, you know, intrusive thoughts, images, or impulses that can be very distressing. And there are, um, in most cases, repetitive behaviors, either physically or mentally, that are um, experienced to bring down the distress, um, follow rules, or prevent a feared outcome. Um, it starts typically um, earlier than other disorders like major depression. It starts in early adolescence. About 25% of the cases start at age 14. Um, its lifetime prevalence is about 2%, which is also comparable to schizophrenia and bipolar illnesses. Um, it is quite commonly comorbid with other um, anxiety disorders and depression. It's about a 10% comorbidity with severe mental illness, which includes schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, and in routine care, you'll see it often with other you know, OC spectrum disorders like tic disorders or eating disorders. Um, there's a high proportion of folks who have serious and moderate illness, um, and it's typically waxing and waning throughout an, an adult person's life. Um, there are two first-line treatments for OCD, medications and CBT, exposure and ritual prevention. Um, what I can say is that I'm going to focus more on exposure and ritual prevention for a variety of reasons. Um, it, it is the first-line treatment for children and adolescents. Um, it can be superior to medications as monotherapy, and the durability of effects is actually, um, it's, it's quite durable if people respond to treatment and the tools and the strategies that they learn as part of treatment are continued to be implemented in practice. Um, it's actually as effective as other medications as an augmentation, augmentation strategy um, for those who are having uh, residual symptoms. And um, some of our colleagues have found that it's as effective um, in routine care as, compor as compared to um, EXRP, which has been traditionally studied in clinical trials. Um, we did a nationwide study to start building this, the case for improving care for access to OCD treatment. Um, and we looked at nationwide office-based practice of individuals who have a diagnosis of OCD, and we found that about only one-third of folks receive treatment with CBT, and most often that's not actually EXRP because it's a quite a specialized treatment, um, and, that, um, and, and that in fact most often people receive treatment with medications. Um, we also did a study to figure out, well, what, what, pati what do patients want? You know, what are, what are the individuals who are um, the consumers here want to receive as part of their treatment? So we did a discrete choice experiment um, preference study, and we found that individuals actually prefer uh, CBT, exposure and ritual prevention, over medications alone. So there's a lot of really good reasons why we need to increase access to CBT, but what we found is that 
in the literature, there are actually a lot of reasons why people don't get CBT. Um, there are a lack of trained therapists, and again, exposure and ritual prevention is an intensive treatment. Um, there are not many people, despite efforts to provide training in EXRP, there are not many trained therapists, and this is especially the case in rural areas where there's also a low availability of clinics. Um, there's high costs associated with training and, and also with um, implementing EXRP, and the practical demands are actually hard to meet. So in exposure and ritual prevention, um, it's actually a type of treatment where the, there is uh, twice weekly sessions of about 90 minutes where clinician and patient meet and do exposure and ritual prevention where an individual is actually exposed to the, exposed to the feared stimuli and are um, coached not to respond to um, their obsessions in the way that they typically would. There are also homework sessions that are done, um, home visits, um, and so it's actually, it, it's difficult to um, know how to increase access. And so one of the recent um, novel efforts that have been um, on the rise are internet-based CBT programs. And, and as we've heard about throughout this entire um, this conference is that there are varying degrees of what you would call internet-based CBT. So they have different levels of technical complexity. So some of them are self-help. Um, some of them include therapist support. Some of them don't. Um, and the healthcare context, I think, um, is, is extremely important when it comes to considering whether some of these types of internet-based CBT treatments can be, can be used and implemented. Um, and I'd say that Australia, the UK, and, and Sweden are in the vanguard when it comes to the development of some of these um, internet-based CBT programs. So it was, it was at an interesting moment after some of the services research that we, do to, we did to build the case for why we should increase access to care and improve access to care for CBT. Um, I was contacted to give a master clinician uh, Se uh, seminar at, by the individuals at Karolinska Institute and learned at that moment, very interestingly enough, about a Swedish model. They're, they call it the Swedish model for ICBT. Um, they have developed an internet-based CBT clinic where they treat pretty much, as my colleagues would say, half of Sweden. Um, they had, it was established in 2007 and, and, and you know, I think this is an older set of data, but they've treated many more now than 3,000 patients um, uh, countrywide. Um, basically what they do is they enroll folks online. People in the community can, you know, find the internet psychiatry clinic and do an online self-assessment of their symptoms. That information then goes to the psychiatry clinic where there is a clinician who reviews all of that information. Um, then the person gets a phone call by a psychiatrist where this, there's an appointment that's set up within 21 days. They have the phone call with the psychiatrist. They're evaluated by phone just to make sure that um, some of their online readings and enrollment um, are, are accurate um, and they receive a, a diagnosis. Um, and then they basically start doing their treatment, and in their treatment is therapist supported, and it varies by protocol, and they have developed protocols for depression, social anxiety, um, panic disorder, OCD, IBS, and health anxiety. And it's, in some ways, the same amount of responsibility as regular health care, and that even the monitoring that the, the individuals receive, given that it is therapist supported, I would argue is, is more than what you might receive in routine care. Um, so I'm going to focus on ICBT for OCD, which is an exposure and ritual prevention-based 10-week therapist-supported program. The first four modules of this, this program are mainly psychoeducational, as in many CBT protocols. And the last five modules are instruction on how to conduct daily exposure and ritual prevention. Um, this has shown good efficacy in randomized controlled trial in OCD patients where um, individuals were compared to who received ICBT were compared to folks who received online non-directive supportive therapy um, and they had some good effect sizes on this treatment. So we thought, okay, let's give it a shot here and see how it goes. First I'll tell you a little bit about the Swedish model. So it's mainly self-help texts that are, you know, a patient goes in, they 
read through a module every week. They get gradual access to the tailored treatment. And what I mean by tailored treatment is that at the end of every module, there is um, a quiz where they have to reflect that they've understood the material that they're learning. And then they complete homework worksheets where they complete self-monitoring logs, um, things that help the therapist through asynchronous communication understand and tailor the treatment to the individual that they're working with. Um, it has an integrated email system, as I said, so asynchronous communication. There are weekly assessments built into the actual integrated system. Um, so any time a person logged in to complete a module, they had to first complete assessments, self-report assessments on OCD, on um, depression, on basically any type of assessment that you'd like to program into the system such that there is um, weekly assessments that the therapists would see. And after then, and, and only then, when they completed the weekly assessments, they would get the module, complete their homework, the therapist is alerted, the therapist reviews all the information, monitors progress, provides feedback, and then grants access to the next module. So it's very, um, the monitoring is very, very close. And, you know, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the adaptations that we had to make, but first I'll just say that there were several advantages. It was one is that we had the ability to increase access to care, which as I've, as I've talked about, is very important. Um, for a variety of reasons, especially with OCD. Um, what, what our Swedish colleagues have found is that you get less attrition, and even in, in the study that we did, our rate was less than face-to-face -face CBT for OCD. Um, the quality of care, as you can see, given the monitoring, given this, this, the ability to, to do asynchronous communication, really allows um, the, the the therapist to really keep an eye on and monitor progress. And so we argue that the quality of care and the actual um, evidence-based treatment that is programmed into this, into this, into this program is really, um, you know, minimizes any kind of drift and maximizes fidelity. So um, thinking about the pipeline from efficacy to implementation, we conceptualized this study as a hybrid type one study where we're really interested in looking at and, and really thinking about how do we take this treatment, bring it over to, the, to New York and the United States and, and see if this, this program will actually work for patients in this setting. So we were very mindful of context. We, you know, when we were doing this study, it was like context, context, context. It's very, very important. So we knew going in that we would have to adapt the ICBT program for OCD. We used a test case phase to do that, and we used, um, we engaged multi-stakeholder teams of clinicians, patients. Um, we had a tech team and our Swedish colleagues pretty much on the phone every two weeks trying to, to adapt this treatment. Then we evaluated it to make sure, okay, does this actually still work? So we had an eye on acceptability, feasibility, and clinical outcomes. And then we wanted to start sort of thinking ahead, you know, if this works, what about it did people like, what did they not like, and what do we need to do to prepare for broader implementation once we arrive at that point? So as my Swedish colleagues would joke, it's time to New Yorkerize the treatment, which we did. Um, we spent a good, I would say, five to six months translating the um, platform from Swedish to English, so I learned some Swedish along the way. Um, so that was our first step. We had to, um, the, the platform was housed in Sweden. We had to develop an English version platform, so we did that. We worked out all the technical and lingo bugs as we, as we would call it. Um, then we actually had our clinicians um, in dyads actually spend some time making sure that in, you know, as patient and clinician taking turns to really understand how to use the, the, the platform and how to actually um, know what it is like for a patient and know what it is like for a therapist. Um, we then uh, tested it in five patients and we did some quantitative and qualitative assessment just to make sure we really um, could, could adapt it in a way and be ready to implement it off the ground. Um, and what, I'm, what I have on this slide here are our adaptations, and we coded our adaptations at three levels, the content, the context, and training and evaluation. And this is 
These are levels that um, want a colleague, Shannon Wilsey Sturman, would say are important to code as you're adapting any, any kind of intervention and you're implementing it. Um, so you can see that, that what we had to do in terms of the content is, of course, we had to translate it to, for, to English. We had to simplify the content and the literacy level, um, and you know we had to change vignettes of Johan to John and things like that. Um, and we we actually you know in our test case phase, what we realized is that our Swedish colleagues did not have phone sessions at all during the Im the implementation, um, both in their pilot and their RCT. And we found that our our patients really wanted phone sessions. They wanted a touch base during the EXRP, and so we started to, you know, on an as-needed basis, provide them with um, phone sessions. There were a lot of um, contextual adaptations. We had our privacy laws would not let us use SMS messaging. We added MP3 files for folks who had difficulty with the text. We had in-person evaluation. Our IRB would not allow us to do online screening or, um, at that point, online um, enrollment. And we actually um, delivered the treatment using master's level clinicians. So we did not actually um, have ex expert therapists. We wanted to see if this could be actually something that we could have master's level clinicians deliver. Um, and we developed a therapist manual and we evaluated it using it the re-aim. And I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go through here quickly and tell you a little bit about the REAIM framework, we looked at um, reach, effectiveness, adoption, both at the patient and therapist levels. Um, I, I can sort of give you the bullets here. We had about um, 28 out of the 40 folks that we enrolled participate up to post-assessment. We evaluated them at baseline post-assessment and four-month follow-up. Um, we were actually able to reach, um, our, we had a predominantly non-Hispanic white sample, but we actually were able to reach individuals, a more diverse sample compared to standard CBT trials. Um, what we found was that our results for effectiveness were on par with Sweden, and so um, from baseline to post-treatment and follow-up, folks improved in their OCD symptoms, their depression, and their quality of life. Um, most folks, completed eight out of 10 modules, um, about 80% said that they were satisfied, they enjoyed it, um, they liked it because it was convenient, it helped them deal with stigma that, has, that had traditionally held them back from seeking care, um, and, and avoid treatment with medications. Um, and, and some of our, um, some of the barriers were, you know, we want, we, we actually want more time with the therapist, and so that's something that we, um, we grappled with a little bit. To, to what extent does this become, um, you know, wh where does the line drawn between how much therapist support is given or not? And um, what I can tell you, though, is that on average, each participant got 24 emails. That's translated to about 164 minutes per participant. There was an average of eight calls per participant that lasted about 23 minutes. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, the limitations and given the time, but what I can say is that um, we, we had to make pr some, some modest adaptations. We wanted to look at effectiveness and implementation. We found that our results were on par with Sweden, and we also found that, um, you know, for a lot of the folks that participated in this trial, um, it, it was the trick that did it for them. They continued on to use it past the post-treatment, even at four-month follow-up. We even see people that are logging into it now, and it's been over a year. Um, we see that it, for some people it, it didn't do the trick, but it was, could be a part of a step care model. It got some people thinking, oh, I might want to actually get more treatment. Um, and so, you know, I think we, um, we found that, that there are some implications for this, whether it does the trick for everyone or not, is to be seen. Um, and we're, we're actually working with our colleagues on, an, on another study now um, as their platform is being used as part of the NHS and the Improving Access to Psychological Therapy study in, in the UK. So we're very excited and thank you for listening. So if the panelists want to stay, and if the audience wants to stay, we can have questions. It's the end of the day. 
Any questions? So I guess one of the biggest questions I have is for those of you who are working on technology products that kind of go direct to consumer. Um, Dr. Chang, I know you mentioned the Sleepio app. Um, you felt the need to include kind of a human support element because that was very important to the people that you were working with, but that was not something provided by those who created the technology. Um, for the rest of you, um, how do you see that playing a role in, uh, I, I have to assume that's one of the biggest challenges in rolling out any kind of like technology mediated um, support either for clinicians or for consumers themselves is that you know, if you create this great technology and then put it in the hands of a primary care physician, they're not going to want to serve as tech support for all of their consumers. So whose responsibility is that? We're creating kind of a great tool and then sending it out into the world, but who's going to actually foster its continued positive use? I'll just briefly answer that um, subsequent to this trial, we had a CMS Healthcare Innovation Award, which was like a $19 million project to create an ideal health system for children. And that model, what we did was create a call, a, a community health worker call center model with uh, actually three mental health therapists who managed everything, everything from assessments all the way through brief therapy, all at, you know, and, and including the writ of supporting the online technology and text-based models. And uh, we could do that for about a dollar a month per person. So we're trying to create a kind of a model, basically that that would come out of the care management budget of an insurance company, basically, that's the model. Wow, that's pretty amazing, <laughs> thanks. And I, I should um, clarify that the, the amount of human input that, that went into the research isn't actually very intensive. It was just research assistants calling, I think, a maximum of two or three times. Um, but, but we did actually look at the uptake of the, the treatment by demographic variables. And what we did find was that those with lower education and lower income, so basically lower SES, had a, a much harder time with uptake. And we can all imagine why that might be, but certainly more work looking into that um, can be helpful, um, as in there are systematic differences in why people drop out. Um, importantly, we did not find any racial differences, which I think is very exciting. Um, typically, we do see differences between white and black or African-American participants, um, but that was not the case with this um, particular uh, app, which, which I think speaks to some of the um, challenges that comes with trust of a medical system versus an, an app that is more readily available and self-driven. But I, I think it's a fundamental question because we've had, I didn't talk about it today, a couple websites that are up to train clinicians in evidence-based treatments, one for kids exposed to trauma, one's for adults with bipolar disorder. And in the end, for sustainability, these technologies need to be refreshed and there needs to be support. And while a lot of the development and the evaluation is grant funding, eventually, those pieces need to be monetized. And they can be monetized to insurance, they can be monetized to patients paying for them, they can be monetized to clinicians, but somewhere along the way, for it to be sustainable, it's not just the support, but it's actually refreshing. Be because otherwise, it's pretty clear for almost all types of technology, websites become stale, apps become stale. How many of you use an app that you loaded up four years ago, right? They're gone. Um, and the, the reason I bring this up, and one of the things it, I wish I had known then, is in some cases, if this is not considered in the actual development of the technology, depending on who the payer is, it becomes actually a not insignificant lift to figure out how to monetize it on the back end because there are decisions made in website access and how that's done and in a number of other places that I've, I've learned from experience. It's like, it can become a much heavier lift if this is not considered, you hear about effectiveness and you hear about implementation. You don't hear about financial sustainability for many of the things we're developing and God knows we all hope we get there 
But if you don't think about it, the front end, it's actually can be an issue. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much.